My name is Michael Burke, and today is June 18th. I'm interviewing Roz Blank at the Max M. Fisher Federation Building in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. This interview is being recorded as part of the Women's in Leadership Oral History Project. Roz, do you give permission to the Leonard N. Simons Jewish Community Archives to publish, duplicate, or otherwise use this recording for educational purposes and for use as deemed appropriate by the archives? I do. Uh, good, I'm glad. Uh, the Women's Philanthropy Department uh, of the Jewish Federation has had several names throughout its history, including Women's Division and Women's Campaign and Education Department. For the purposes of this interview, uh, the quest uh, questions will refer to it by the current name, Women's Philanthropy. But you may use whatever name uh, you're comfortable with, and me too, because I, you know, I, I remember the women's division. Yes, in my but form. it changed during the time I was president. It, so know, women's philanthropy is yeah is easy to come. Out so let so let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? I was born in Detroit. Yeah. In December of 1952, and um, I lived with my grandmother and my parents, and then we moved to Oak Park in 54. This is a typical thing. And I yeah, lived, what part of the city did you uh, were on you born Sturt in? Event. So, you know, around Central High, Central yeah. and those things. I don't obviously don't remember that too much, yeah. but then I lived in Oak Park till I was 16 and then Southfield and the typical. Oak Park High School? No, that's when I moved to Southfield after junior high school, after Clinton. Then I went to Southfield Lathrop. So my kids went to Southfield Lathrop. No. <laughs> Um, how was religion uh, observed in your family as uh, a child in your household? So I grew up in Oak Park, as I said, where everybody was Jewish. I remember I had one friend, one friend when I was in second grade, there was one girl that wasn't Jewish that was so unusual. So Judaism was just part of my life. We, everybody was Jewish. And um, my aunt lived on my block. My two other aunts lived a couple blocks away. We had chicken and brisket every Friday night. My mother lit candles. We, you know, went to the holiday, high holidays services. It, my dad worked on Saturdays. We weren't Shomer Shabbos. So it was just part of my life, but it wasn't talked about that much. It was just there. Where did you live there. in Oak Park? On Gardner, south uh, of Nine. Uh -huh. I lived on Kenosha, south of Nine. Oh, my, really? My first house as a oh. married Oh, yeah, as that a was, married, as yeah. A married man. So right. what, what synagogue did you belong to? B'nai David. Uh-huh. Okay. Villain today. Yeah. Um, what role did philanthropy pay, play in your uh, life growing up as a child? Really not much. You know, my parents, my dad worked really hard. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. My dad worked, it was part of my life, I think my dad worked seven days a week. What did he do? He had a, an auto parts store. Mm -hmm. You know, just him and his mother, because his father passed away when I was six weeks old. So he and his mother had a small auto parts store. They weren't there, then the store wasn't open. So, um, um, oh, I can't remember the question. You better edit this. <laughs> Oh, oh, philanthropy. So they weren't philanthropists. I mean, I think they gave a couple bucks here, a couple, but it wasn't talked about. It really wasn't part of my life growing up. So what I, was the trigger for you? Uh, it's a little out of order, but since we're there, okay, that, so I, that, I'll that caused you to, uh, uh, you know, consider okay. philanthropy an important part of your life. Okay. So I think it's being part of the community. I don't like calling it philanthropy or what I do philanthropy. I don't consider, even though everybody who gives some money, who gives back, is considered a philanthropist. That's why they changed the, the name to women's philanthropy. Although to me, I think it's just being part of the community. And um, so I went to Camp Tamarack as a kid. I was a candy striper at Sinai Hospital as a kid. A very stereotypical upbringing. I went to Hebrew school my whole life. Which Hebrew school did you go to? B'nai David. And, um, so, but what really changed it is when I was in college, I was in the first cohort of Project Join, Jewish Occupational Interns from JVS. And that was an eye-opener to me. It was like, it, this is this mini government that's taking care of the Jewish people. You know, in, JV, in, in Project Join, you go to visit all the different agencies and then you work. And I worked actually at Federation with Alan Candell in the, in the planning department in those days downtown you know, whatever it was on downtown. 163 Madison. You asked for 163 Madison, that's it. And I learned a lot that summer, and it was fascinating to me. I really, that, that changed my whole way. I, it changed my life, I think. What, what agencies uh, 
stuck out in your mind as you did it? Because it was a unique project and uh, being able to go to each one of the agencies and learn about them. And, you know, so I'm, I'm curious which were the ones that really resonated. Oh, way you. back then? Way back then. Well, I think the whole Federation concept, you know, I didn't understand the concept. Like I said, I had gone to Camp Tamarack. I had been a candy striper, you know, when I was 12, 13, 14. Did I have any idea that it really came together, that it was really like this Federation was this an umbrella organization, especially then more than today when each of the agencies are doing their own fundraising. Then the centrality of Federation was even more so. Um, I was just fascinated by the whole concept and, and, and still am. I, I love the concept of Federation and what it does for our community. I think it's a mini government. The agencies that I remember from those days, I definitely remember going to JVS. I remember Al Asher. I remember him talking to us. Um, that's probably the one that really sticks out mm -hmm. in my mind because a lot of the agencies, this is 40 some years ago, um, combined are different, but JVS. I remember going there. So when did Federation come onto your doorstep? When did you become involved with Federation? And what was the trigger there that you, that you wanted to get involved with Federation? I was asked. I'm sure, and I think that'll be a recurring theme for everything that I'll say. I was asked. I don't remember who asked me or why, but um, I'm a lawyer by degree. I came home from law school, and someone asked me to be on the board of what's now YAD, but it was Young, I mean, it was, yeah, the Young Adult Division is now Next Gen. Right. So I don't remember, I just remember being on the board at the time. And who were the leaders when you first got involved that uh, were, were running, the, uh, the, running the engine? You Do you know remember what? them? Not really. I mean, I knew, I mean, a little bit. I knew of the names and, you know, if you name them, I'll go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, it was a long time ago. So... It was probably since 1978 or 79, you know, those were, but I was just on the board, the little, you know, doing my thing. Um, I remember Norman, I mean, I remember the young adult division presidents, my friends Norman Beitner and Betsy Hewer was really involved, and at that time David Wallace, it might have even been David Wallace that asked me to be on the board. And, and so what were the things that you became involved in immediately back then, can you remember? No. <laughs> No, I can't. I remember being on the board. That's about what I remember. And then I remember maybe a few years after that, um, Herschel Sandberg, who was my doctor, asked me to be on the board of Jewish Apartments and Services, which was the first board I ever was on, and I, I loved it. I mean, I didn't realize how much I would love being at meetings, and which I do. I always learn from it and meet people, and that was the first board. Well, I guess I was on the Young Adult Division board, but that was the first agency board I had been on. And tell me about the other agencies along the way that you've served. I've, I've been on a lot of agency well, boards, and I like it, and I think it all goes, it's one big circle, and, you know, we're all one big family, one big community. I've been on, I was on Jewish Apartments and Services for many years. I was on Jewish Vocational Service, or JVS, they don't call it Jewish Vocational Service anymore. And I was on there 20 years ago when I couldn't go to morning meetings or because I had kids at home, and I'm now on it again when I'm able to go to more meetings. Um, great agency. And I was on Tamarack for a while. I've been on Jewish Family Service. Um, I don't know what other agencies are there. There's a lot more. I have not been on any of the education in the schools, and that's a lot of it. Jewish Community Relations Council, I've been on that. I've been on a lot of them, which is really good because I sort of can see the whole thing, I think. Yeah, let me ask you a question that's not in, you know, uh, you've been very involved, really very community-wide, and I think, you know, you're not unique, but you are unique. Do you have a sense that other people, kind of the every person, understand the Federation concept that you suggested at the beginning until you went through the, the you know, the JOIN program, you really didn't understand the connection? Do you, do you think that uh, the, uh, the women particularly, because that's what we're talking, understand the federated concept? And are we being successful in helping them to understand that concept? I think that you constantly have to do it. You know, what, the, th the type of programs that we had 40 years ago or 30 years ago from women's philanthropy till now are sort of the same. You want to keep in educating and engaging women. 
So I think it's not something you inherently understand what the federation system is, and all the different programs by whatever name you want to call that, that you know, Community Connections or Jewish Working Women's Network or used to be BNP, all those things when they have a new woman there, a new person, and we'll talk about women versus not women, a new person, it's not inherent. You have to learn it. And I think most people in our community don't understand what, what Federation is. And I think that's, I think it's so important. I mean, I really think that, that I don't know how you get to each person, but I think instead of whatever 12,000, 13,000 people giving to Federation, we have a community of 60 some thousand. We should have 30,000 people giving, I mean, or more. I think every adult should be giving to Federation. Do you think women's philanthropy does a good job in educating uh, the people who they serve in the community? Educating the people who they serve? Yeah. Do, are you talking about the women in the community? The women you know, in who the donate yeah. and yeah, get educated? The women in the community. I think that's a constant a theme, and I think they try. And I think the women who come and do the community connections or whatever the engagement programs are do learn. And I think they get a much better idea. And I think I think it's necessary, but there's always new women coming up, there's always women you know, you just have to keep going and going and going, and keep trying to do it. Yes. What about the rest of the Federation? How do you grade them and their ability to educate uh, the community? I think these engagement things really, really work. So I, I, I don't know, but I know there's other engagement things. I know NextGen has engagement things. I know there's this affinities thing that has engagement things. I think all these engagement things where you're exposed to really what our community does works. You know, some people after seeing it aren't interested, but some people are. What I found was that the leadership, not all, wait, not everybody who came to these engagement things became leaders, but almost all leaders went to one of these engagement things. Years, decades ago, I was in a room filled with past presidents, and they were talking about how they got involved. Everyone got involved, almost everyone got involved, by doing one of those engagement things first and learning about the breadth and the depth of what our community does. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it's really necessary. And you think that's true for the men, too? Um, first of all, I think we're people. I mean, I've never been one to think there should be women or not women. And when I became president of Women's Philanthropy, um, I had to figure out a reason why I thought women's philanthropy was still good as a, a standalone. Is it okay that I'm going off script? <laughs> no, so, I'm going off script too. Is it okay that I'm yeah, talking this way? Absolutely. And what I, can't, what, I, what I truly believe now is that women's philanthropy engages more women than general federation. It's more, they don't have as many programs, they can't reach as many people. It's just not so the women's philanthropy is necessary. There's got a history. I'm very big into history and, and tradition, and so they have a tradition of women's philanthropy. It's been it's proven that um, if you have two separate, you know, if you get from the women and the men, and you have a women's campaign in total, you're going to raise more money. So that's really important. And I also think that women's philanthropy. Um, I know it provided for me, but a a platform, whatever the word is called now, a platform from which I could learn all these skills that maybe I have developed over the course of the years. And regular federation wouldn't have. I'm, I'm not one of those people that they, were, they wouldn't have latched on to me a regular federation. They wouldn't, you know, that's just me. I don't have the background. I wasn't giving to the degree that, you know, people look for. And I think women's philanthropy is a, is a very m more easily entry point for, for, for becoming involved in the community and, and gathering those kind of skills. So do you think that um, the general community can learn some lessons from women's philanthropy to make us a better federation? Um, I think they're doing that with the affinities groups and with these other things that I don't really know about. <laughs> or Yeah, I mean, you have to engage, you have to, people have to know what you're doing and you have to learn about it. There's, it's so fascinating what federation does. Yeah, let's talk about your family just for a moment. Was your husband, in, is your husband involved in... Federation activity at all? Rare, no, because that's just not his nature. But he has, I was thinking about when I was reading the thing, I mean, he, I don't know if it wasn't for me that he would be a donor to the degree that he is today. Mm -hmm. And what did your family think as you became more and more involved in Federation? How did that resonate? Uh, With my personal family? Your, my of family. course. 
You know, they want me at their beck and call. So, you know, they didn't love it. And I didn't go to meetings at night anymore. I didn't go to meetings. You know, I was around for my family. And that was why um, volunteering, I mean, I think volunteering is great because when my kids were little or when they were growing up, I could be with them. So my day was from 10 to 2 or 10 to 3, and that's when I could go to meetings. I would never go on a board that had night meetings because then, you know, I wasn't available for them. I used to go, I had to come late, go early. It was just ridiculous. So for me, volunteering from 10 to 3 was a, it was, it was a great thing for me to keep busy and stimulated. And so t talk about, um, you know, the, the whole educational process. We've talked about it. What role did you play in helping to educate uh, women's philanthropy in specific and oh, maybe God. a broader base from all of the, the involvement that you've had with other agencies? Yeah. I've been on a lot of committees that do that. So maybe, you know, I don't think I spearheaded that much, but um, I was on the committees to do it. They, uh, community Connections may have come. I might have been the head of it at the beginning of that where they, you know, had it where you go through the different agencies, like I said. Um, they have, um, I w helped with um, the penny harvest, you know what that is, the, you know, so that's one of the things that, that I sort of started with, I did start with friends of mine, and I thought that really taught kids how to look at, look at giving money and, and the collective as opposed, the collective's really important to, to me, and I think that's, um, what I want people to learn. So mm -hmm. the penny harvest part of it, and different agencies. It's nothing tremendous that I know of. Um, what um, positions did you hold in women's philanthropy over the years? Probably everything. Well, but let's, I was yeah. on committees. Yeah. I was the co-chair of committees. I was a socio co-chair of committees. I mean, you're talking about 30 years. So I was on. Lots. I mean, women's, in women's philanthropy, I probably did, over the course of the years, I probably did most everything. Yeah. So what caused you to want to be president? I never wanted to be president. I never aspired to be president. I saw that on the question. Um, I never even thought of it, and I think that was probably the best for me. Um, Susie Pappas, for several years, would ask me, are you interested in being president? I go, I'm not going to be president. I don't give enough money. I just don't have the ability. I can't stand talking. And, in front of people and and for years she would say this and then by the time that I was asked I was thrilled that I was asked I guess you know but it's not like there was something that I aspired to be or that I set myself up to, to do with that. So des describe your, you know, you, before you were president you were chair of the campaign mm -hmm. so describe your duties as chair of the campaign what were the important things to you when you were the chair this is a two-part question I don't usually mm -hmm. ask <laughs> and then kind of go into mm -hmm the duties that you had uh, when you were president, and were, what were some of the things that you particularly focused on in both of those roles? Well, I think when you become, so you become associate campaign chair, and then you become campaign chair, and then you become president is the normal course. Nothing guaranteed when they say that, but that is like the normal course of what happens. And you really work with a team. So I, um, before me was Lisa Lease, and uh, before that Marcy, and I worked with I met with them several times a week, you know, for years. And they are wonderful, wonderful community leaders, as you know. And they are just, you know, they both have, they, all, they both have so many strengths, but they're different. And um, it was just a pleasure to learn so much from them. So it's really teamwork and you work a lot with your professional. And as campaign chair, what do you try to get as much money from as many people as you can? And what I wanted to do, which I hope to still be able to do, was try to get new donors. I mean, my goal is to get as many donors as I could. But as you were, you're meeting and you're doing this fundraiser and you're doing this telethon, the, the years go by fast and your, your, your time's up. So I think we got some new donors. We had some initiatives, but, you know, it's, it's, that's hard. Was there anything that was particularly successful, Roz, when you were uh, trying know. to broaden the base? I, I think the first time we had this thing called... I don't know, maybe it was two and through or something. You get find two new donors, and then you don't have to find two more donors. And, you know, I thought, and I don't know if that's the one that worked or the one one and done. <laughs> I mean, we tried all these different ways. And the truth of the matter is it's not easy to get money. And today, over the course of the last 40 years, you have telethons, even though that's still the best way of doing 
who answers the phone? I mean, I used to go to telethons and 80% of the people would answer their phone and talk to you and you got the money. Now, if you can sit there for three hours, if two people answer the phone, you're lucky. You know, it's just a very different way. How to reach people with different ways of communication is making it more difficult, I think. Do you find the competition is stiffer now than it was when you first started? from other agencies, even our own family of agencies, well, that's but, I, but beyond that. Well, that's what I was saying. I think at the beginning, from, you know, from my position, which wasn't really in the know, from what I understand is that the agencies really couldn't do their own fundraising. Right. It was very limited. So the, the, I think it was Edith Jack used to call it the supremacy of the campaign. Everything was the supremacy of the campaign. And um, so the other agencies, there wasn't the same kind of of, of competition at all. And now each agency, and I've been told, and I'm sure it's true, that in, in the aggregate, doing it the way it's being done now, you raise more money for the community, and, which is really important. But it is causing competition, and if you don't know what federation is as opposed to Jewish Family Service, the Jewish Family Service is the safety net of the community, then why wouldn't you give directly to Jewish Family Service and not give to federation or not as much to federation? And you have to really kind of understand the whole system in order to understand how important federation is. Well, it seems to me the women's philanthropy does that, maybe not perfect, but better than most entities in, in our family. And uh, uh, so sort of uh, go from where we were to being the president and what were your priorities when you became president of uh, women's philanthropy? First of all, those two years went by so fast, so it's hard to, but the same kind of thing. You want to, it's twofold. You want to um, educate as many women as you can, so engage more, uh, uh, more than educate, well, I guess educate and engage go hand in hand because you're going to educate some and educate a lot, and from that you're going to hopefully engage some. And then to the end is Federation does raise dollars. I mean, it took me probably 20 years of all in Federation to realize that Federation is the fundraising organization. That's what it does. That's the whole purpose. So the education is so you understand why the money, the dollars are important and why you should give. They used to say, which resonated with me, is that it's the it's the Jewish government. It's like your taxes. And now taxes have a dirty word, but I don't think so. The taxes pay for the streets and the fire and things that you need. And Federation provides for things that you, we have as a Jewish community, whether you, God forbid, need some of the services that, you know, or God forbid, or that you go into the Jewish Center. We have a vibrant Jewish Center. You send your kids to Camp Tamarack. You go tomorrow to the um, Israel at 70. That wouldn't be without federation. For all the all the agencies wouldn't be what they are today without federation. Do you think the agencies understand that? Um, some more, some less. I mean, some more. I've seen it on many, many allocation committees, and it's, it's been over the course of these decades, and it's been very interesting. And I think that probably is the most interesting thing. As I became on the the planning and allocation steering committee, that was probably the most interesting meetings that I've gone to. Um, some, some more or less, and it's all dealing with people, and it's all numbers. There's never going to be enough money to fund all the needs, and it's it's an interesting, it's an interesting system, but it kind of works. So you uh, just mentioned uh, Marcy and Lisa as people that you really met with to help with your education. Were there any others who particularly stand out to you as mentors and people who've helped? kind of create and uh, mold you as a leader in the community? I don't think anyone really took me under their wing to do that. I mean, Florine a little bit has said, Florine Marks has said some things to me when she was, ta she was talking about people being afraid to speak up, and then she came up afterwards and she said, I'm talking to you, oh, you Roz, which I, made me feel wonderful. But a lot of the women that came before me, because remember 40 years ago there was all these, these old women who are no longer here with us, and they, and their stories and what they did, it just that's the kind of thing I wanted to do because I like doing it selfishly. You know, I like going to meetings. I like helping people. I like raising, you know, I don't love raising money, but I like the whole system and I like being part of the community. So, you know, I do remember Tilly Brandwine and, and, and Edith Jackier and all those people who came before. I didn't know them personally and they probably didn't know me. But just to w listen to them speak and hear what they were doing is very, Penny Blumenstein, I mean, it's very inspirational. Nancy Grossfeld, 
all of them, they're very inspirational people. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question related to that. Uh, it may be a little out of order, but uh, I'm not concerned. Um, what's your sense about the security of not only the Federation, but the Women's Department in terms of current and future leadership? Are you comfortable that there is a cadre of people um, moving into roles that are going to do, do well by us as a community? I think as a community, I, well, first of all, when you're done being president of Women's Philanthropy, past presidents all told me, when you're done, you leave it to the next person. So since it's been, it's been only two years, but I'm not as involved in Women's Philanthropy as I had been before. I do think there's women coming up that are very interested, and I think, so Women's Philanthropy, I do think, has a, a community, the community as a whole, I think with, there's a, so many programs going on in our community that are really raising knowledgeable Jewish people that are interested. I mean, Wexner's here this year, right, in the last year, and I think um, that's really important. And then there's something, I can't remember who, who else, another program that was brought here. There's a lot of programs coming to Detroit, and I think those are wonderful training grounds. So I think our Jewish community is going to be well served in the future. Do you think that the women are getting their due as it relates to some of these leadership programs? Are they, be, are they being well represented in your opinion? Okay, so this is my honest opinion. That's I think that for. women's philanthropy, at least as of two years ago, and it maybe it hopefully has changed, I think it was, was treated as its own entity and not part of general. We weren't included in, and then we started becoming included in the campaign meetings, you know, the general campaign. Why we weren't, I, I don't know. And, and for the past several years, there's many women who come up through Grossfeld or mainly Grossfeld, and I would be seeing them at other, um, on other boards that I served at. I went on a Grossfeld meeting, now I'm on this board. I went on that, which is wonderful, but, they don't, but I've heard the phrase so many times, we're not women's philanthropy people. What does that mean? To me, if you're a woman and you're in this community, you're women's philanthropy. I don't see, there shouldn't be a disconnect between coming up through Grossfeld or being part of women's philanthropy. So I don't think necessarily, well this year maybe I think Leah did more to include women who are part of women's philanthropy or active in women's philanthropy on the board and in other com committees and other organizations within our community, which I think is really important. Well you talked about a disconnect. Is there something that we should be doing more to connect women to the you know, women always took pride in, uh, you know, I can speak because I was at Federation before you were born almost. No, uh, no, 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 uh, I'm sure the same time. But, but, you know, women took pride in, you know, the, the separation, the women's, uh, you know, department. And, you know, there, there is a sense now of, you know, the collective. And I'm just wondering if you, you know, you, you can articulate some of the things that we should and might be doing to merge uh, women's philanthropy and the community at large, because we, after all, we are one. You know. I think that all the women, and this is what I never had time to, the women who are serving on all these boards within our community, and the women who are com uh, participating in these leadership things through the Affinities Group, through Next Gen, through, they should be told more about women's philanthropy, what is available through women's philanthropy, that we're one thing, when we have, um, and maybe this year they did, but when we have something that they're as much a part of women's philanthropy as someone who goes to the meetings that are on the committee of women's philanthropy, that you don't have to be on the women's philanthropy committee at noon or 11 o'clock planning a party to be part of women's philanthropy. We're one community. So I think that this, at least as of two years ago, it didn't have this culture. I'm not a women's philanthropy person. I didn't come up through the ranks that way. And I, I don't like that whole culture if that's what it is. It, it should be everybody's, every woman's part of women's philanthropy. That's kind of interesting what you say because I serve on a few boards as well. And women are being more and more and better represented on those boards in the community. And it would seem to me, if you want to connect what, what you've exactly articulated, getting people to understand the responsibility of a board person to the community at large is, uh, and to and women's philanthropy uh, could be a really great project for the, for the community. Well, they to did try. Forward. I mean, that's when we tried to get community, con I mean, it's hard because it's a lot of time, but when we did Community Connections, which was, is our engagement program, 
we looked at the boards of all the different uh, agencies to try to get women who were on those boards to come to women's philanthropy, and it and it happened. Yeah, it was and it was I, successful. I think it's successful, uh -huh. and I think there's also was a program that doesn't exist anymore, where we took women's philanthropy and we had liaisons called Link, where it was Lisa Lisa's idea, and they were on the boards too. And I thought, and I still think that's a program we should bring back because. If you're on women's philanthropy, that's a way of learning from um, from the other, not other side, but another aspect of the community. Just like you said, is there an adversarial relationship between you see both sides and you understand how it works as a whole. So I think that's really important. And if you look at these boards that you're on, and how do the, you know, how do the women get on that board? What are they involved in before they're on the board? And, and that's something to, 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 take to just look. look at. Yeah, good point. Uh, we, you know, we talked about the partnership between the women uh, and the general community, but there's another partnership out there too. It's the um, volunteer to professional. So maybe you can speak to me about uh, the people that you've, you've worked with and the role you think volunteers play in helping to move uh, the agenda forward and, you know, who stands out uh, to you particularly, uh, Roz. Okay, well first let's go back to the role of uh, the volunteer okay. and I think that's where women's philanthropy is different than the Federation as a whole. Because women's philanthropy, I've always thought, is more, is more, it's not hands-on, that's not the right word, but affords you more, like we talked about, the ability to use your skills and to learn more skills. And there's time to do that. Whereas in general, they, they don't. You're not coming to Federation and going to an allocation committee meeting and, and doing skills building for you. So I think women's philanthropy, if you want to like build your skills, and whether you want to take it back and go be the president of your kid's PTO, or you know, work at a, you know, Kadima, or Jewish Family Service, that's where women's philanthropy can, can do something. And I think, I, I know we talked about it, I'm sure we had some of those skill building kinds of things, but I think that's where women's philanthropy can excel. So that's, in terms of skill building and volunteerism, I think it's important. You know, I don't know if this is, actually I've said this a few times and it never happened, but you know, if somebody within women's philanthropy has a good idea, women's philanthropy should be an enabler in the good sense of the term. You know, not that they should spend all their time doing it in resources. If it doesn't use resources, they can help. And I think the, the, the two things that I did, you know, or that I can that stand out is, you know, the penny harvest part, which was my idea. And, and I remember somebody saying, if you do it, that's fine. You know, it was part of Sadaka experience. And I got on the phone and I called all these places and got bags and schools and parent liaisons and that's where I learned and it was fun and if it didn't work out it didn't work out but it happened to work out and I would never have started or been involved with with Bookstock if I hadn't done that and Bookstock the same thing the other um, organizations all help without that there would be no Bookstock right. you know so I think that's I, women's philanthropy afforded me those opportunities and I think that it should for, afford those for other women as well I think it shouldn't be so um, and, and it depends. I don't know who's come with ideas, but I think it should be known for that. You have an idea, you want it, you know, let's see what we can do to help each other. And that's what I think women's philanthropy can do. I've worked with wonderful professionals over the years. I mean, like I said, it's been 40 years. I've worked with, you know, Amy, who's working now, could not be any better. She really wants to work with you and help you and, you know, anything you want, you know. Um, before that, I worked with Jennifer Levine, and they switched, and they have very different styles, just like everybody else. I love Jennifer. She's very passionate. She's very knowledgeable. Um, before that, Jennifer Noparstack, which was um, right before when I said I would work, and I, I like her as a person. She's a lot more um, forceful, and she, she's, you know, I don't know if we, if we worked together throughout those five years. She probably would have, you know, it, it, everybody works differently, you know, but personally, I love her. Um, I've worked with a lot. Marion Friedman was wonderful. I think Cheryl Geyer at the time maybe was a professional. It was like lots and lots of them. You know, and, and at the beginning of the first ones, I really, did I really know them? No. They were just, they were the professionals and I was on a committee. Well, so speak to the partnership. What do you, you know, what do you, you know, you, you've talked about wonderful people. Mm -hmm. I, I share your, uh, 
your, you know, your joy in that. But you know, how how would you describe, you know, kind of the ideal partnership, knowing that you know there are different personalities between the volunteer and the professional. Be for women's, I can't. No, it's, well, we're talking I, about I, women's. Women's philanthropy. Yeah. I think it's it's worked out. I mean, the different personalities. I think everybody. The one thing, I think it was Lisa who said that, but maybe Marcy and Lisa before I became president, they said every president has to make it their own. You have to be, you have to be yourself and make it your own. So I think that every um, director of women's philanthropy has to make it her own, and they will, they will, it's always been a her so far, and they will deal with, you know, not deal with, but work with the perfect it's all relationship building and every group has different relationships and it, and it seems to it always works out i mean i haven't for many many years been many 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 years when i was nothing heard bad things about a professional we really have wonderful people who work here where does woman philanthropy fit into your priorities of things that have been important to you as a volunteer the most the yeah. most yeah. yeah, I've met more people, I've become more involved, I've learned more, I felt good about it. And, I, and that's just all about me, but I, as I was no, saying about, the, I believe in the Federation system, truly believe in the Federation system. And, um, and I've learned that through women's philanthropy. Well, so as women's philanthropy uh, provided the impetus for you to get involved in other agencies, or is it vice versa, or is it a combination of both and does women's philanthropy play an important? Can they play an important role as uh, you know that kind of a uh, a tool uh, to help the community uh, broaden and strengthen? I think it should. That's what I've been saying. I think it should, and I think that's where its strength is at. And I think it was probably both. Like I said, Dr. Sandberg asked me to go on the Jewish Apartments Board, and I was on this board, and I could see that you. You get a better feeling for the whole thing when you are on different. You just learn from everything you're involved in. So, how did Dr. Stanberg hear about you? Was it? I was a patient. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you that's how he heard about yeah. me. I mean, I don't know what went on in the nominating committee. You know, nominating committees are who's on the committee and who, who knows you. You know, I'm on the Jewish Fund Board now, and um, Jim Bellinson called me, who I really didn't know. And he asked me, and I was shocked. I always wanted to be on the Jewish Fund Board, but I didn't think I would ever be, or maybe not for 10, 20 years down the road. And when he called me, I was a little shocked, and I said, you nominated me, didn't you? He doesn't know me, but I met Cindy Eggleton, who started this nonprofit Brewing mm -hmm. Detroit with him, and she has these wonderful rose-colored glasses that I'm sure she like. And, and I know she talked about me, and that's why she nominated me, and that's why I'm on it now, which I'm very honored to be. But you know, nominating committees are like that. It's who's in the room. It's lo it's a lot of luck. Yeah. And uh, do you feel that the women's philanthropy program has interacted reasonably effectively with the community at large? And you know, as we've moved forward, I you? think better than than other parts of federation because you do have all these programs where you go into the different agencies and learn about them. And how's the women's philanthropy changed in your estimation since you first started to where it is today? just a couple of years after your presidency. Yeah. You know, I think, as I said, I think the goals are still the same. I think the goals are to raise um, engaged, educated, engaged members of our community in order to raise the dollars for the needs that we have. And I think that, so I don't think it's changed much. I think you're reinventing. I think what used to be business and professional is now the Jewish Working Women's Network. It's the same thing. It's to learn about federation. It's to network. And it's ultimately to, you know, get an appreciation for our community and raise the dollars that are needed to make it work. And do you think there's a, there is and there should be a continued role for women's philanthropy in our uh, community agenda? Does it play an important role in your estimation? I do. I, I really do. And, I, and, and when I was president, it was like I, was, I had to talk about that and I had to think about that. So. What I said to you about before, there's, it's an easier entry point for people. You learn more, you learn, can learn more about the community. I think it serves that point, and I think it, there's, a, there's a role for it there. I it's, think when you're dealing with the, you know, if there wasn't a women's philanthropy, I don't think that, I know I wouldn't have um, been um, afforded these positions and opportunities that I have been. 
What, you know, th this question isn't on the uh, agenda, but it, it seems like a, a good question. Mm -hmm. What is the relationship, or what should the relationship mm -hmm. be between women's philanthropy and next gen? In terms of, you know, strengthening the community uh, and the natural, you know, the nature of people funneling in appropriate yeah, ways. This has been, I'm telling you, that conversation has been going on going for 30 years. I, mean, I remember sitting at United Hebrew Schools, the exact same conversation. How do you get people from Yah to go into women's philanthropy? It's the same thing, and there's new people every time, and you just keep grappling with the same thing, and you just it's the same thing over and over again. So you will get some people involved, and you'll lose some people, and that's just the way it is as people get involved in other things. Why do you think it's important? We've talked about it, but I'll just mm -hmm. kind of that women's philanthropy have their own campaign. Uh, and, and it's separate and distinct from kind of the... Because it does raise more money. I mean, I've been, that's what I've been told. And, and if you ultimately raise more money for our community, then it's important. Do you think that the women's philanthropy... And it really isn't separate. I mean, it's one pot. Yeah. So you're just, they call it that. It's one pot of money. Well, you, you mentioned earlier kind of uh, your husband and he wouldn't be as involved philanthropically had you not been involved. Do you think that that is true in other scenarios that because of women's involvement, uh, you know, husbands uh, and families mm -hmm. are more philanthropic? I would assume so. Isn't that what they say in Judaism? You teach a woman, you teach the family. Yeah, that's what, you know? yeah. So that's what they say. And I'm sure that I'm not the only one that that's what it is. And I think in a lot of the cases, the um, their spouses become more involved. They do it together as, as, as a couple. They do it together as a family. And that's, to me, the, the ultimate thing that you really want. You want your, whole, you want your whole family engaged. Do you find that your involvement in women's philanthropy and the community at large has had a positive impact on your children? And I want you to speak about your children just for a little bit. So I have three children. Um, my oldest lives in Denver. Um, she's more like my husband. She's quieter, and I think she sees me do it, you know, and um, she's not that involved, but maybe she will be one day, but not unless her personality changes. My son is extremely involved. He's part of Wexner. He's president-elect of um, Next Gen. He's more involved than I am, and years ago, they wanted him to say for an article or something in the Jewish News that it's because of me, that that's why he does it, and he said no. And that's, and, um, but the, the truth of the matter is, is he's a lot, a lot like me. He likes, he likes to be busy. He likes to learn. He likes to be involved. He likes to feel part of the community. And not, he's not doing it because of me, but he's doing it because he has the same kind of, you know, likes, likes as I do and interests as I do. And he's really learning a lot more than I am with this Wexner, and I'm so thrilled for him. And then I have a younger daughter who is 25 and lives in New York, and she's not involved, but who knows what the, you know. I mean, she went to, they went to Tamarack. They see the community. They see what I've done, and they see how I've enjoyed it. Well, so, you know, for the record, if you want to, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to at least name who they are. Oh, so my oldest daughter is Lisa, and her last name's Ehrlich, and I have a, a five-month-old granddaughter Mazel now in, in um, Denver. And my son is Adam Blank, and he's getting married to Lauren Mondry this summer, which is wonderful, and hopefully she'll be involved with him, I hope. And my daughter, Jenna, lives in New York, and um, has a boyfriend from New York. Hopefully she'll come back here. Adam doesn't want to be the only child home when we get older. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> Why is philanthropy so important to your ass? I don't know, like I said at the beginning, I don't know if what I do is called philanthropy or is just right. being part of the community. The community why, is really important. Why is to community? Me. You're right. I feel part of it. It makes my life. I feel like I'm part of something greater than myself. And it brings me joy, and I feel that it, it's, it brings me joy, and I think it brings everybody who's involved in joy. And if you can lift up as an individual, you know, if I'm, for, I'm fortunate enough to be able to give up my time and whatever treasure I have to be able to lift up the community a little bit. But mostly it's, it's, it's good. For, when you're doing that, it's doing it for everybody, including yourself. And what are your hopes for uh, women's philanthropy in the coming years? Uh, if you had to articulate two or three things you'd like to see. I'd like to see it more ingrained in, in federation and more of a, um, an appreciation for the leadership skills and what the people involved have. 
and not have women say, I'm not part of women's philanthropy. I mean, I, I don't like that conversation at all. That's one. Um, I'd like to see more women donating. I'd like to see don't. You know, I'd like to see you know more new gifts. I'd like to see an appreciation in the the Jewish community as a whole of what Federation is. That everybody gives something. I don't care if it's eighteen dollars, ten dollars, but you should be a donor. I'd like to see those 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 numbers go up. And I think in terms of engaging women, they're doing a wonderful job, and just do more of it. So I'm going to ask one last question because it's not on our list anymore, but I think it's important that you say a word or two about what you feel the relationship is between the Women's Foundation and women's philanthropy. Oh. So um, yesterday somebody asked me, should I, um, what's the line of Judah and what does it mean? So that, you know, is the $5,000 giving level and, you know, you're giving more to the campaign, you can go to the line of Judah London, you can go to the line of Judah conference. And which is all wonderful, and you're doing more for the community than you, you, you every dollar does something for the community, you know that. Um, and then she asked me about the Jewish Women's Foundation, which you know is, is a pooling, it's more like a giving circle, and you have and you learn about the agencies, and you give um, and you make decisions of where your money's going. When you give to Federation, there are committees that make the decision because you don't know as much, and, and, I, and I believe in that. Um, the Jewish Women's Foundation, I see for me and I've been part of it since pretty much the beginning, is um, a gift to myself. I learned a tremendous amount for about sitting in that room, listening to how ideas are made, um, listening to what they're looking at, um, how they're giving. That's sort of like the icing on the cake. Federation provides for the community, and Jewish Women's Foundation supplies more. You know, it, it's all good. They're all good. But they're, they're two different things, and they're, and they're both important. But the most important is, is Federation. Okay, is there anything else that uh, you, that we may, might, have, might have missed that you would like to suggest? No, I said just make me look young and articulate. That's fine. <laughs> well, you're both. Oh, <laughs> it's no, I'm not, but thank you.